so in, in, in my uh, hurry to put on my black tie, I forgot my reading glasses. And <laughs> I'm very uh, hard of, 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 of seeing, so I, I think that my speech will have much less of the flair of Kiri's. Uh, but I'm very grateful to him for essentially making my case uh, uh, for me. And I think the biggest disagreement we have in terms of deciding, uh, well, so we agree, support the winner. And the, the argument I have to make is simply that we should, in deciding on the winner, play the long game. So I'll start by observing that it is unhelpful to conceive of states as analogous to biological persons. We can and we must ask of a country uh, whether its policies uh, promote the welfare of its citizens and to what extent uh, they're compatible with the welfare of citizens of other countries. Uh, but to ask whether their policies are moral, just, or right, this would have meaning only for casuists or for demagogues. As such, I have nothing to say about democratic values or human rights. I understand today's question as about the material interests of the overwhelming majority of the citizens of the European Union, today and for the immediately foreseeable future. The answer is clear. The US is a rapidly declining power, and China is on the rise. If for reasons of nostalgia, identity, or ideology, the EU privileges its relationship with the US, it nails its colors to the mast of a sinking ship. Measured by current GDP, the US may be the world's richest country, but China stands, stands already in second place, and adjusted for purchasing power parity, China is already on top. <laughs> Anyone who's traveled to China recently will testify that in some respects, China is already ahead of the West, in some respects and in some regions. For example, China has 42,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. That's three centimeters a person. Whereas, <laughs> whereas the US has 80 kilometers. That's one quarter of one millimeter per person. <laughs> Since 1982, China has lifted 800 million of its citizens out of poverty, and through its Belt and Road Initiative and its participation in the New Development Bank, it is helping other countries to do likewise. Now, some may say that this debt trap diplomacy is just a sinister ploy for world domination. And I say, maybe they're right. <laughs> but the structural adjustments of the IMF and the dollar-denominated loans from the World Bank have so far only exacerbated global inequality and worsened poverty, especially in Africa. Competition in the provision of de development finance should be welcomed by everyone. And objectively, China is offering more favorable terms than the US and its Bretton Woods lackeys. As elsewhere, China's economic development has come at an environmental cost. China has the world's largest carbon footprint, with the US in second place, although in per capita terms, China stands in seventh, the US in second, with only Saudi Arabia ahead. However, there are signs that China may soon turn the quarter towards a green economy. At the close of 2020, China boasted 253 gigawatts of photovoltaic capacity, a third of the world's total. Two years later, the US has achieved less than half of this capacity, with only 110 gigawatts. Also, last year, 30% of new cars sold in China were electric. Compare that to the 7% of the US. China holds the potential not only to contribute to a greener, but also to a safer future. And this is where I think uh, Kiri and I would most agree. The United States has the largest military in the world and rarely hesitates to use it. Wars of aggression cost 1.35 million lives in Vietnam, 
650,000 in Iraq, 200,000 in Afghanistan. Since 1970, the U.S. has financed or mili militarily supported so-called regime change in <sighs> Colombia, Chile, Bolivia, Ethiopia, Angola, East Timor, Argentina, Poland, Chad, Nicaragua, Granada, <laughs> Panama, Zaire, Yugoslavia, Kyrgyzstan, the Palestinian Authority of Libya, and Pakistan. <laughs> okay. It has done so twice in Syria, Haiti, and Afghanistan, and three times in Iraq. Thus, on average, the U.S. destabilizes a country every two years. <laughs> Even setting aside the human costs, these U.S. military adventures are typically failures, purely in military terms. This year, the U.S. military budget amounted to $847 billion, four times China's in absolute terms, and 17 times China's per capita. In face of such mind-boggling costs, to me, the bungled invasion of Venezuela in 2020 comically underlined the bankruptcy of the U.S.'s pretense to be the world's policeman. The sooner the U.S. realizes its limits, the safer we all will sleep. The U.S. habitually runs nuclear submarines up and down China's coastline, just outside China's territorial waters, to recognize the remarkable restraint that China shows in the face of this overt uh, provocation. One need only imagine how the U.S. would react if China did anything remotely similar. In contrast, China last saw war in 1979, as we just heard, as America's lackey, when it invaded Vietnam with a combined cost to both sides of 70,000 lives. That's it, since 1970. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, ah, but what about Tibet and Xinjiang? Now, I've spent the whole of my academic career studying Tibet, and I have no intention of making light of the dire situation in these areas. Nonetheless, these situations have absolutely no bearing on the welfare of EU citizens. <laughs> In short, <laughs> in short, China broadly keeps to international norms, whereas the U.S. is a petulant thug. From the viewpoint of global peace, China is unambiguously the more reliable partner. Now, members of the audience may feel that I have cherry-picked a few facts that cast China in a positive light <laughs> and cast the U.S. in an unfavorable light. So let me emphasize that none of these facts, even all of them taken together, are the reason why I think the House should vote in favor of the motion. Instead, I draw this conclusion from the long-term course of global history itself. The scholarship of world systems theory, particularly Giovanni Arrighi's The Long 20th Century, published in 1994, argues that since the time wage, excuse me, since the time wage labor came to pr predominate as the social institution for organizing production, world history can be divided into three distinct phases, each associated with the rise and the subsequent decline of a hegemonic power. In the 17th century, this power was the United Provinces of the Netherlands. Throughout most of the 18th and the 19th century, it was the UK. And in the 20th century, the US was the unambiguous hegemon. In each case, this power rose on the back of an unusually productive manufacturing section, was sustained through control of world commerce and as each respective power slowly declined, it enjoyed an afterlife as a hub of finance. So, so we can see right now, UK, hub of finance, U, uh, US still in control of global commerce, China, major manufacturing power. This arc of industrialization, commercialization, and financialization 
also coincides with an ideological zigzag from protectionism to free trade back to protectionism. If globalization and deregulation were the path to mutual prosperity and world peace, as we incessantly heard from 1980 until the global pandemic, why in 2023 do we hear loud calls for export bans to China and tariffs on Chinese goods? The answer is that the US has shed its mantle of hegemony and is settling in for its long decline. The EU can either join the US in its bellicose dotage, or it can join China in proactively shaping a prosperous, sustainable, and peaceful community of shared destiny for mankind.